Jeanette Bogue is an assistant professor of computer science for robotics here at Stanford. She directs the Interactive Perception and Robot Learning Lab. Let me just... Uh, and her research is focused on uh, robotic grasping and manipulation. She has received several early career and best paper awards, most notably the 2019 IEEE, I think that's the way you say it, Robotics and Automation Society Early Career Award, and the 2020 Robotics Science and Systems Early Career Award. And it's always really interesting uh, talking to her, and, and we have a link below to another discussion we did with her and, and two other roboticists here at Stanford, uh, because I hear so much about, we all hear so much about the incredible advances in artificial intelligence and computers, um, <clears throat> and the incredible complex problems they're solving, and then you talk to roboticists, and you find out that there's still some very basic things that are a challenge for robots, in, in particular, manipulating, you know, grabbing and moving basic everyday objects. And so this is a, a big part of what, what Jeanette's research focuses on, uh, and we'll, she'll be talking today about how her successes in this field and her failures have informed her approach to this topic and her thinking about the future of it. And so with that, I'm excited to hand it over to Jeanette. Uh, two quick, one other quick notes, just a reminder, we will have a Q&A at the end, so please submit those questions in the Q&A box. Uh, Jeanette will be also sharing her screen, so your media player may expand, you can resize it. And she will be sharing a few videos, and it's unfortunately just the nature of our platform that those videos will be a little bit choppy. It's not anything on your end or anything we can troubleshoot on our end. Uh, but you should still be able to see the basic robotic uh, motion, and, and Jeanette will be able to get her, her basic points across. But that's just a note for you. So with that, uh, Jeanette, I'm going to hand, uh, hand the, the uh, reins over to you. Thank you very much, Pax, for the really nice introduction and for uh, kind of giving a preview of what I'm going to talk about. So let me just quickly share my screen. So I hope everyone is going to see that. So today, I really want to talk about what I've learned from my successes and failures in my work uh, and how that informs my current research, research and what I think is important in robotic grasping and manipulation. Um, so I, I really uncovered some principles uh, there that I think will bring us closer to autonomous robots. Um, yeah, so with that, um, I just want to mention again, my research is on robotic manipulation and grasping, and uh, it's really driven by the puzzle of why humans can effortlessly manipulate any kind of object, while it is really hard to reproduce this skill on a robot that has a completely different embodiment from a person. And so in my first PhD research work that I've done uh, kind of starting 2008, 9, and then published in this paper in 2010, I tried to address um, this particular challenge by looking into finding suitable grasping points for any kind of object. And we assume that these objects are presented to the robot as 2D images, and it's supposed to kind of find these points in these images. And so we formalized this problem of grasp point detection in images as a classification problem as put forward by Saxena et al. in 2006. So imagine you have this robot who wants to pick up this cup from the table, and it sees this cup through a camera. And we compute a per pixel feature um, and compute the probability that this pixel represents a good grasping point. So y equals 1 here means good grasping point. And how do we train the simple classifier? Um, we use the same database that was put forward by Saxena et al. and use supervised learning to train, in this case, an SVM. Remember, this was 2006 pre-deep learning. Um, OK, so the contribution that uh, I made in my uh, particular work uh, was on the feature representation. Uh, I proposed to use something called shape context that captures the shape of an entire object relative to a pixel in that particular image. So really, here is how this uh, looks like. Uh, and specifically, we have this uh, particular histogram feature here. And we showed that this really uh, indeed outperforms the previous feature formulation by uh, a large margin for many different objects. OK, so this is really just a quick um, uh, walkthrough through that method. And so now, uh, uh, given this feature representation, we have an idea what pixel in the RGB image uh, of this cup here, for example, represents a good grasping point. 
Um, but of course, grasping is a spatial process, uh, a 3D process, really. And we need to infer uh, um, an orientation and a position of the hand uh, that is somehow linked uh, to that 2D grasping point. And the details here are not very important, uh, but we basically use local 3D information around that 2D grasping point we detected in the image uh, to infer eventually like a really a hand pose um, for the robot. Um, okay, so here are uh, two examples uh, of this work, of this method that I just talked about in action. Uh, and in both of these videos, they are, uh, the robot is going to successfully grasp an object. So this is quite a vintage video. Remember, this is uh, in 2009. Uh, so here, the robot uh, that I used with this three-fingered hand is basically going to um, um, grasp uh, this particular box um, and uh, will be successfully lifting it. And uh, the second video here, it's also going to be successful. The robot's also going to be successfully grasping, but maybe also pay attention to the shadows here in the background. So I hope you see that despite the video being a bit choppy, this was me, uh, basically uh, an absolute joy <laughs> that this actually worked. And so you can infer from how happy I, I am back in 2009 that this actually worked, that this method actually was really hard to make work and that, that it didn't necessarily work that often. And so here, I also want to share with you a few failures. Um, this first one here, for example, is more of an, I would say, an accidental grasp. The, the, this object, the spray bottle, eventually ends up in the hand, but it's really more like a coincidence. And the second one, um, you see, uh, this is maybe a little hard to see due to the quality of the video, but there's a cup on this table and the robot tries to grasp it and uh, it's gonna slip off the rim of the cup. And so you see it could actually really need some tactile feedback to understand that uh, this is actually not gonna work. Okay, so what are the insights um, that I gained uh, from this project? Um, so the, the work, the earlier work that I based my work on by Saxena has certainly kickstarted the entire field of learning to grasp for robots. And it departed from prior work that made many, many assumptions about what is known about the object. Um, it also did not uh, infer uh, precise uh, contact points, but uh, only hand poses. And today, we actually find many interesting works that basically follow this overall approach. Um, like here, for example, the Google Iron Farm or DexNet uh, by uh, Ken Goldberg's lab. Um, so these approaches have basically nowadays better data, better learning approaches, and so on. And uh, if you want to know more about these, you can look at these surveys, one written by myself in 2012 and a newer one in 2019. Um, so I made uh, contributions uh, to this field uh, throughout the years, but um, this first approach that I just showed you was actually extremely brittle and failed often. And here's what I learned. So 2D grasping points um, really do not carry enough information to be successful in grasping. They still have to be transformed to a three-dimensional hand pose, so a position and an orientation of the hand. And this conversion can be very brittle. Also, open loop control of the robot arm does not work. So not taking any, for example, tactile feedback in account to determine if things are actually going well does not work. And also, the um, approach uh, that I showed you completely ignores the environmental context and requires careful post-processing of any movement of the robot for collision checking and so on. So, um, so for me personally, the real value of this first ever, this first PhD project uh, that I've done was not actually in the scientific contributions, although there was one, but the real value for me personally was in the lesson I learned on what works and especially on what does not work in robotic grasping. Um, so the first thing uh, I learned is that uh, grasp representation really matter and, and uh, matter a lot, and they should be spatial, so three dimensional. Uh, continuous multimodal feedback and constant replanning is 
crucial uh, in robotic manipulation. And uh, maybe to many of you who work with robots, this may be obvious, but it wasn't uh, obvious for me back in 2009. And it's not necessarily obvious on how to actually do it um, in real time. And then uh, a last point, uh, instead of avoiding collision with everything else but the target object, um, the, uh, it really helps the robot and also us as people if we exploit contact with the environment. And I will explain a little bit more later on what I mean. But uh, let's first start with the first point. So how do we get spatial grasp representation of, instead of just like one point in the image? So let's get rid of this 2D grasping point uh, detected in RGB images that this prior work has done. So, and the reason why we want that is uh, because a good grasp actually uh, depends on both um, the shape and the form of the object, but also on the capabilities and kinematics of the gripper. And so um, in my lab, we proposed a method called UniGrasp for grasping any object uh, with any gripper. And so to achieve this, Unigras selects uh, sets of uh, contact points. And uh, as input, it takes the object point cloud uh, recorded with some um, you know, 3D camera and the specification of the kinematics and geometry of the robot hand. And then this model, Unigras, sequentially outputs contact points. And these contact points are both reachable by the hand, uh, basically contact points of each of the fingers. And they are also in something called force closure, which you can just think about uh, a grasp actually being stable and uh, the hand being able to balance uh, the object in the hand without dropping it. Uh, so Unigrasp is able to extract gripper geometry and kinematic features and concatenate them with object features in this encoding stage, in the first stage of this model. And uh, I will explain this model first. So we use uh, something called a URDF file of the gripper. So it's basically a description of the kinematics and geometry of a robotic hand or of a robot in general. And uh, using this description, we generate a point cloud of the gripper in a particular joint configuration. And we use these point clouds as input to train uh, an autoencoder to learn a low dimensional uh, feature representation um, that encodes the geometry of the robotic hands in specific joint configuration. And we, yen we then use the encoder to compute features in different um, with uh, different hand configurations, so for example, different openings um, and concatenate them. And so this here, what you see here is a visualization of the embedding space. So you first compute uh, the features of two input point clouds here on the left and on the right, uh, circled in red. And we interpolate these two features and decode these interpolated features into gripper point clouds. Um, that you actually see here in the middle. You can see that the top row uh, shows uh, prismatic joint movement, so basically an opening and closing of the fingers. And the middle row represents a revolute joint movement, so basically it's changing the angle. And the bottom row shows the geometry changes between two types of different 3D fingered robotic hands. So uh, what the slide basically shows is that this latent space that represents gripper geometry and kinematics has, um, uh, can be meaningfully interpolated and also generalized over different hands. OK, so in addition to the gripper feature that I just showed you, uh, we also extract an object feature using a, point, a model called PointNet++ uh, and concatenate it with the gripper feature. And then the concatenated feature will be fed into a point set selection network to sequentially output uh, contact points for the robotic hand. And so we, we propose a new model for solving the difficult combinatorial problem of finding a set of contact points among the object point clouds. And I don't have time to explain uh, this very complex model here, uh, but I'm just going to walk you through a more abstract uh, representation of this model. So uh, given an end-fingered uh, gripper, 
um, the network has n stages. So in stage one, the model estimates the probability for each point in the object point cloud if the point um, uh, belongs to a valid set of contact points. And after ranking these points, the model selects the top k points that are shown here in blue. And then conditioned on one of these uh, points, uh, one of these blue points selected in the first stage, the model now predicts the probability of each point in the point cloud to form a valid set of contacts with the first uh, point. And these points are then ranked again, and the top k points are selected. And then finally, in stage three, we select the third contact point for this three-fingered hand here in this case, uh, conditioned on the first two contact points. And so the network is trained to output points that are in false closure, so produce a stable grasp, and are also reachable by the hand uh, in the first place. And before executing the grasp, we still kin check kinematic feasibility for the hand. OK, so here's how this actually looks like for a toy example to visualize how our model predicts reasonable contact points that are dependent on the gripper geometry and of the kinematics as well. So in black here, you see the object, uh, and in blue, the gripper. And the first gripper has uh, a very small opening of the two fingers. So the model, um, our model, Unigras, generates contact points at the thin part of the object. And here, the second hand, uh, this one uh, has the same shape, but it cannot fully close the fingers, uh, but instead it can open very widely. So the model outputs contact points that are on a thicker part of the object. And finally, for a three-fingered hand, the model also, again, outputs reasonable contact points for each of the fingers. Um, so we used the, our model Unigrasp uh, to grasp um, objects shown in the middle here with five different uh, robotic hands uh, that you see here at the bottom that are really quite different. Um, and uh, here, I want to show you a bunch of videos that I hope are uh, OK visible to you. Uh, so we basically test our model by grasping novel objects that um, this model hasn't been trained on with a known gripper. And here, known gripper means that we have trained our model with that gripper. We test when using the this what is called the Robotique 3F gripper. And our model achieves 95% success rate on these 65 trials that we have done on real hardware. And uh, But even more interesting with this model, something that no other model has actually done, is um, to we wanted to see if we can grasp objects, novel objects, with novel grip grippers that the model hasn't been trained on. Um, so uh, here you we see uh, new robotic hands, uh, or by actually it's a hand uh, that we have trained our model on, except we have removed in our description file one of the fingers. So it, it, it's now only a two-fingered gripper. And our model achieves 93% grasp success rate on 60 trials, which is really good. And here's a very interesting anthropomorphic hand with four fingers. Um, and uh, it's called the Allegro hand. And our model achieves 90% success rate, um, um, while our baseline method achieves only 40%. And of course, um, there are some failure cases as well. And these are typically due to imprecise perception, uh, low frictions or slippery objects, object deformations, and premature contact with the, with the object. And so uh, I, just to summarize this particular work, uh, the main idea is here that, uh, that we can feed a model with a object and a hand description, something that hasn't been previously done, to compute contact points for the fingers instead of like one 2D grasping point. And uh, the algorithmic contribution here was a point set selection network that I br really briefly explained. And um, the result is a model that outputs valid, valid grasp also for novel robotic hands, which is really relevant for for example, if you think um, in manufacturing, when a robot gets a new hand, right, you may not want to retrain uh, your model. 
Okay, so uh, this was um, giving you an idea of how we've removed that one assumption from this uh, old model to make it basically better and uh, in terms of introducing a spatial grasp representation. And um, I want to come to the next point, which is um, the importance of continuous feedback during actually executing a grasp and the ability to replan. So uh, what, I don't know, for, for those of you who have worked with robots, it's probably relatively clear uh, that you have to close something called the perception action loop around um, uh, high dimensional sensory data that comes, for example, from cameras or from tactile sensors. Um, so it means that basically the robot should be able to continuously take feedback into account and react to it. Um, but how to do that concretely on a high dimensional system is an open question. And so um, I started focusing directly on this time, uh, on this point uh, using this particular robot. So here's an example for some behavior that the resulting system uh, that we built produces um, and um, you see um, here that uh, this robot is called Apollo. It has to grasp the Springles box without knocking anything over. And uh, my colleague here, Jim Mainprice, he makes it really hard for Apollo by moving around these objects in the environment and it has to react in milliseconds. Uh, Apollo, the robot, has to keep track of the environment in real time and provide the feedback to a fast motion generation mechanism that drives the behavior and allows it to react. So it's, this is really a system where real-time perception meets reactive motion generation. And so here is a very simplified figure of how the architecture of such a system, of a robotic system that is operating under the hood, uh, actually looks like. Um, and I have no time to explain each box, but each of them makes a contribution to either robust real-time uh, visual robot arm or object tracking or online trajectory generation. Um, what I want you to pay attention to is how these real-time perception methods and reactive motion generation methods are actually connected. And so in our sy system, everything is connected in loops um, of different frequencies where sensory data feeds into controllers or motion optimization methods. Um, also, um, all of these things come at different uh, rates. So the camera runs at 30 hertz, the haptic uh, sensor runs at kilohertz. So all of this has to be processed asynchronously. And notice that this is not a hierarchy or something, it's really a bunch of loops. Um, so it's important, uh, one thing important to note is that it doesn't matter how amazing each of these components are, if you put them together in the wrong way, your system will not work well. And uh, in this paper, we showed exactly this in, um, empirically. So let me walk you through one loop uh, in the system. So we start with raw sensory data uh, that what you see is basically a point cloud uh, from the top. And what you don't really see here is that there's also some haptic data and feedback on where the joints of the robot currently are. Um, so RGB and depth data come in at 30 hertz and proprioceptive data from the robot at a kilohertz. So, and then using real-time visual tracking methods, this data is processed to infer the object pose, the robot arm pose, and obstacles in the environment that you see here in these uh, kind of rainbow-colored uh, little voxels. And given this information, we compute a potential field where the target object provides an attractive potential, and the obstacles um, um, basically uh, provide a repulsive potential, as shown here with the red arrows. Uh, so this feedback is used by local controllers that compute the optimal action that bring the arm closer to the object, to the target object, and push it away from the obstacles. Um, and then we also use online trajectory optimizers that optimize actions over a time horizon of two seconds and produce what we call acceleration policies. So in this case, it's called Riemannian motion policies uh, that are tracked with uh, some low-level controller. Um, and this online trajectory optimizer is much slower than the uh, very uh, basic uh, feedback controllers and therefore cannot react as quickly to changes, uh, but it's certainly less susceptible to local minima. And we fuse these two types of policies to obtain a fused policy that is updated at a kilohertz and that you see here uh, in yellow. 
Okay, so uh, in this paper, we compare three system architectures. We have a standard sense plan act architecture that senses first, then plans, and then acts without taking feedback into account. And then we have a reactive architecture that does not look ahead uh, for computing the next best action, but runs extremely fast at a kilohertz. And we have the proposed architecture that runs a number of loops asynchronously, including an online planner that looks ahead for optimizing the next action. And so we evaluated these different system architectures that all consist of the same components um, in four different scenarios. Um, and uh, I can only, uh, in the interest of time, only show you this one example. Um, so here, what you see is just an overview of the setup. Um, um, the robot basically has to, again, uh, pick and place this uh, box here, this cylindrical chips uh, box. Um, pick it up and bring it to the other side of the table on the right. And what happens here specifically is that this cardboard box is being pushed in the way. And um, yeah, basically the robot has to avoid it. And at the bottom right corner, you see what the robot sees. So these kind of uh, voxels and uh, you know the colorful voxels uh, down there um, is what the robot basically has available as information. OK, so here first is this sense plan act architecture that basically senses once, plans once, and then executes. And it doesn't take feedback into account, so it doesn't realize there's a box in a way. So just going to uh, basically collide with it, right? And uh, we'll just go through. This, of course, is OK in this scenario because the box is light. But of course, you want to definitely avoid that. And so here in the middle, we have the system that uh, uses a reactive controller. And you see that it manages to uh, not really collide as, uh, with this box, uh, it, but it also cannot really find a way to get to the other side, although there is, right? And it does recover uh, once the box is removed, but it's basically stuck in a local minimum. And so the uh, proposed method uh, can cope with this. Um, so even though the box gets in the way, it is able to look ahead uh, in time and find uh, this narrow passage between the box and its own body to, go to get the box to the other side. Um, so this combination of a, a long horizon trajectory optimizer with um, um, a fast local controller is really uh, the best option that we have here. OK, so just to summarize this particular part of the talk, um, uh, we, the main idea of this, uh, of this work was um, that system architectures really have to consist of these interlocked perception action loops that uh, connect um, sensory feedback with uh, motion controllers. And then the contribution that we made here was that we really evaluated uh, the influence of system architecture on performance uh, of the system. And uh, the result was a, um, a system that can perform successfully manipulate objects in uncertain and dynamic environments. All right, so uh, with that, I want to come. Um, uh, so that part, I basically emphasized how important it is that a robot is able to take continuity feedback into account and be able to replan. And uh, the last point that I took away from my initial PhD work was that um, uh, a robot really benefits from actually exploiting the environment rather than only avoiding it. Um, so let me explain uh, what that means. So it turns out that uh, humans are actually not uh, avoiding the environment when manipulating objects, which is something that we always uh, try robots um, try to make robots do. Or in, for example, autonomous driving, it's very important to avoid the environment, right? But in manipulation, it's actually detrimental. So here is an, an example from Julia Child, Chopping Potatoes, that was introduced to the community by this professor, Matt Mason, from CMU. And for example, you see how she's using her knuckles as a constraint to guide the knife. Uh, and this is just one of the things that she does uh, to exploit the environment. Um, and so there are other examples of smart design. So for example, this ATM here, uh, they often, this has this funnel around the card slot to make it easier for people to insert uh, the card. And so um, 
autonomously learning robot skills, any kind of manipulation skills is really challenging as you see here. So these are examples for very contact rich tasks like peg insertion or a wrench task or inserting a battery into a phone at the very right. And they require quite some accuracy and have a very small margin of error. And uh, in fact, um, there are many examples where it is shown that getting in touch with the environment instead of um, uh, and exploiting it um, makes grasping more robust. So here's an example for peg insertion that is really hard. But when we put this kind of bracket there, this uh, fixture, as we call it, in red, suddenly this becomes easy because the fixture, it blocks the wrong motion uh, of the robot. It really acts like a funnel uh, that restricts the motion of the robot and guides the robot towards a successful goal. Um, so other people have also recognized this, um, that um, um, these environmental constraints can be exploited. And here are some examples. Um, however, the majority of these of the works in this area, they are often designed how the environment can be exploited and thereby determine the behavior uh, ahead of time. And what we've wondered in our work is that if a robot can discover how to best place these kinds of fixtures uh, itself. So this is really the question uh, we ask in this work. Uh, can a robot autonomously discover how to ease manipulation skill learning problems through the optimal placement of such a fixture of the red fixture that you've seen uh, in this video before? So our approach consists of an inner and an outer loop that each run uh, reinforcement learning. And so the outer loop uh, learns to place a physical fixture um that you that you see here so um you see like this uh, blue robot has this red fixture in the hand and it tries to learn how to place it best so that the other robot uh, can do the insertion task uh, so the inner loop learns the manipulation skill uh, given this fixture pose and after a fixed number of iteration this inner loop returns the achieved reward um, to the outer loop and so the higher the reward achieved by the inner loop, the more reward the fixture pose receives in the outer loop. So um, we formulate this outer loop problem as a contextual bandit problem. And the goal is to learn a good policy for choosing an action uh, given the context. And the context here is really a depth image of this manipulation task of the object uh, that is being um, uh, manipulated. So in the outer loop, we are learning uh, QW uh, that approximates the true Q function, um, which outputs the expected reward after taking an action A. And the context is the depth image uh, here, uh, represented by this gray image, and is processed by CNN. And uh, so, and at, um, so basically, the, the action is uh, placing this fixture in, in black here and the state is this SF. And uh, at test time, we use an algorithm called QT up uh, to find an optimal action. So we take this QW and we find the maximum, the action AF that maximizes the expected reward. And that's basically our uh, policy. Um, so there is like a particular challenge here in learning this QW. Um, that approximates the true Q function. And, the, and the, that is that the true Q function is actually discontinuous. So let me explain. So uh, for training, um, so basically you have here um, on the um, y-axis the expected reward. So you want that to be high um, for particular good actions. And on the x-axis, you have particular options for a fixture pose. And uh, you see that on the very left, uh, the fixture, this uh, black bracket, is basically covering the hole. And of course, that means that the other robot cannot even insert uh, anything into that hole. Uh, so that should give very low reward. And then as soon as you perfectly align the bracket with that hole, as you see in this middle option, suddenly the expected reward is really high. And uh, then the further we remove it, the reward kind of uh, gracefully degrades. But the problem is there is this discontinuity there. Uh, so for training, we proposed a new smooth zooming algorithm that we show is capable of learning this discontinuous function. And I'm not going to go into detail of this. Uh, feel free to look at the paper if you're interested. 
Um, so for the inner loop, I also mentioned that we use uh, reinforcement learning, but there we use model free RL uh, that learns the good policy for the specific task given a particular uh, bracket. And so what we found is that learning is really significantly faster with a good fixture placement. Uh, with a good fixture placement. So here, what you see is that um, uh, you see basically the success rate uh, on the top um, given different conditions. So if we have an optimal fixture placement in orange, the success rate becomes really fast, uh, really high. And if we have a suboptimal fixture placement uh, in purple, um, the robot has a really hard time actually learning it. Without a fixture, it takes even longer. So um, uh, I think what is happening here is that this particular red uh, fixture there is really constraining the action space uh, that doesn't have to be explored. Uh, so it makes learning really faster. And for the other tasks we explored in this paper, the picture is kind of similar. OK, so uh, putting it all together, um, one thing to remember here is basically the faster the inner loop robot learns how to do the peg insertion task in this particular case, the higher is the reward for the outer loop robot. And so it notices which uh, fixture placement is actually the best. And here's a visualization of this QW function uh, for fixture post selection. And maybe I don't go into detail of this one, but it basically learns something uh, meaningful. And so here is, uh, here's an example of how this actually looks like on a real robot. Uh, so first, the robot is basically trying to figure out, like, OK, which one of these placements of the fixture gives me the highest expected reward? And once it found it, um, the, the other robot is basically doing the manipulation task giving this post. And you saw that it was really fast at doing that. And here was uh, another test, a wrench test. You also saw the other robot was holding the red block, finding a good position to support the second robot to do the actual wrench task. And here uh, is a task of, it's called shallow depth insertion. It's basically how to automatically insert a battery into your phone. And you see that um, uh, this is quite a complex manipulation for the robot holding the, the battery, the yellow uh, part. And so a correct fixture placement is really making it easier for it. And one cool thing uh, about this approach is that um, we actually trained all of this in simulation, and then we directly test the resulting policy in the real world. And, um, um, and additionally, um, because of this physical fixture, the learned policy also generalizes to new pack shape, and the robot doesn't even know that these have different shapes. Uh, but the fixture placement is just uh, kind of generalizing to these different shapes. Yeah, so just to summarize uh, this particular uh, part, the main idea of this, of this research uh, project was to learn, to let a robot learn how to alter the environment to help scaffold uh, manipulation learning for another robot, to help it to learn faster. And uh, we made an algorithmic contribution that I didn't explain much in detail here, but the result was more robust manipulation and, and learning is sped up dramatically. Uh, once you find the right fixture placement. OK, so with this, I want to conclude my talk. And I showed you some results from my first project I've done during my PhD. And I gave you three lessons that I personally took away from observing the li limitations of this first work. And I showed you three works that address these challenges. Um, so first, I showed you some work that infers contact points instead of, um, um, instead of these 2D grasping points. Uh, and uh, that work allowed you to infer really a spatial grasping pose of the hand, and even with novel hands. Um, and I showed you a, a concrete example for a system architecture that consists of interlock perception action loops and uh, can deal with dynamic, uh, dynamically changing and uncertain environments uh, by allowing continuous feedback and replanning. And finally, I also showed you work in which a robot can learn to alter the environment to scaffold manipulation, and where the robot holding this yellow part here can really exploit the environment to do more robust manipulation. OK, so yeah, so after all of these works, of course, we are looking at uh, more interesting research questions, like, uh, for example, how can we include more uh, sensing modalities like vision, touch, motion, language, and uh, even sound? 
And uh, we are looking at more difficult manipulation tasks. So for example, long horizon tasks or manipulating deformable objects like rope and, and uh, laundry. And we are also looking at how multiple robots can actually coordinate uh, with each other in a good way, for example, for um, conveyor belt operations or multi-drone delivery systems. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and I thank, of course, all my students and uh, my funding sources for providing uh, the means to do this research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeanette. That was wonderful and <clears throat> really appreciated that. And, uh, and we have a lot of great questions. So with that, I, I want to jump into the Q&A. And we, we have, um, so Jeanette, we have kind of an interesting mix of both very specific and some general questions. So I thought I would start maybe with a general one that builds off your last, uh, your last point around how robots are using, can use, create environmental constraints to scaffold the learning for another robot. And so what do you, this is kind of a big question. So in terms of the built environment, how do you see it changing in order to accommodate robots? Or, or, or will robots continue to sort of learn to work within the human built environment? I, one example that I came across when preparing for this was that apparently brick laying is very hard for robots to do. And, and one of the reasons is bricks are kind of built for being manipulated by people and not robots. So where do you see the future of, of kind of built in environmental constraints aiding robots versus humans and, and that whole, I guess it's a very big question, but I'm curious to yeah. hear your thoughts. Yeah, it's it's a very, very good question. So in fact, um, yeah, there are kind of like two current facts on, on this, I guess. So first of all, robots are very incapable in unstructured environments at the moment, right? It's very hard to make them work. So what where robots are currently working really well are environments that are actually built for them in a way, right? And uh, so in factories where assembly lines are um, uh, basically met, like basically where robots are working on, on assembly lines, they are typically structured for them so that they have an easier time manipulating and where uncertainty is also reduced as much as possible. And so I think... Uh, uh, it's basically a requirement right now to design the environment such that a robot works uh, reasonably well. And so what what we really, uh, so the second, that's one fact of the current kind of state of things. And the second one is that um, people are also exploiting environmental constraints. And in fact, there are really good designs of products and of the home or of just everyday environments that make it easy for people to manipulate them. Just like this one example I had, like right with the ATM, for example, uh, but just think of doorknobs and of, of door handles and, you know, your stove and how they are designed, right? They are all made somehow for people. And um, so I think it's, it's very viable to also consider designing your environment um, for robots to make it easier for them, but also maybe to change the hardware of robots to make it easier uh, for them to manipulate things that are already in our environment. Um, and in our work, we were really interested in if the environment is maybe not as friendly to a robot right now, how can a robot uh, um, basically change it autonomously to help itself or maybe help another robot. And so um, this work that I showed is really just the beginning of it. And it still uh, has there, the robot only has very few choices of what to actually do. And it can't really pick the shape of the environmental constraints. For example, we give it one shape. Um, and so there are really interesting questions there that um, uh, to explore and how to expand this um, towards this vision that I just outlined that a robot can actually help itself to manipulate better. So if you want to work on that idea, you should come to the course and explore that research project. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Um, we have a couple other, I don't know if this is a good segue, but the question just popped up um, is, and this is again, maybe a high level uh, question, have there been biologically inspired um, solutions for object grasping? Are they and I, so I don't know quite how we would interpret that. Whether it's it's sort of inspirations from nature or whether trying to 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 reverse engineer how humans do it 
but I, I guess I'll leave it there. Have there been any biologically solutions for object? Uh, yeah, things? for sure. Yeah, I think um, uh, I think especially when it comes to hand design, uh, many many hands are actually biologically inspired and are anthropomorphic, right? And uh, I showed like two examples in this presentation of two hands that are really looking like human hands. Uh, maybe have one finger, uh, only four fingers instead of five. Um, so they are definitely this, but it turns out that um, sometimes non-biological uh, solutions are actually working much better. So for example, one of our partners uh, who we're uh, doing research with um, is, has actually developed uh, a particular end effector for a, uh, a, a two-fingered gripper uh, that is more like a hook, and it really... Uh, it really eases everything suddenly, right? So that so there is a value of also just thinking outside of what we know um, uh, or what we see. Um, so it's and it's sometimes really hard to decide, like, oh, is the biological um, inspired solution here uh, actually good, or can we think outside of the box because it's a robot and we have the ability to design? Um, and so you know, sometimes you want something that is not biologically inspired. But this idea of exploiting environmental constraints is actually um, inspired by observing how people manipulate it. So in a, you could think of it as biologically inspired. Uh, so staying on this topic, because it seems like we're getting some more interesting questions around this. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the whole question, and I, I, so I, I don't understand part of it. So, But can you speak to the modeling the environment with a minimal sparse spatial matrix? So basically, can you speak to how a robot can reduce complexity in the environment to just the relevant in info for the task, right? How, does a, 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 how can or does a robot deal, and maybe this is beyond the current research, deal with a complex environment and figure out, I, I don't need to deal with all this noise over here. I just want to deal with this right in front of me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is like a very hard question, um, and yeah, that, that's like ongoing an ongoing research question. And there are many different ways on how to do that. For example, there is a biologically inspired approach that is called attention. Um, so people are actually also doing that, right? Like they focus on parts that are important to the task that they are doing right now, and they kind of like ignore even unconsciously, like um, that uh, things that are not important. And so um, there are also ways on how to implement that on a robot so that it, for example, visually only pays attention to things that are somehow salient and pop out or um, that are uh, probably relevant for the task it's doing. And uh, we, have, uh, we have done work on this actually on training um, um, uh, a model that uh, is task depend is paying attention to certain things in a task dependent way, and as training data, we used um, um, eye tracking, uh, or we track basically where people are searching when they are supposed to find a particular object in an image, and um, so we just used this eye tracking data and trained uh, a model for for robots basically on this. Another way on how to have a robot compress all the sensory information that comes in is by learning lower dimensional representation of this very high dimensional sensory data in the context of a task. So that's actually what we've done in a work that I haven't presented here at all, uh, where a robot is also supposed to do a manipulation task. And uh, we learn uh, from you know, high dimensional images and tactile data to compress it into just like 124 dimensional vector. And we showed that uh, this is good enough for actually then feeding it into a learned policy to do the task. And so that's um, really learned in the context of the task as well. Um, and the, the somewhat the limitation there I see is that um, these representations, they don't necessarily gen generalize to other tasks, right? And so uh, I think what we haven't yet figured out is how to compress information for automatically for any kind of task, right? So we, we can do it pretty well for one task, but then that kind of compressed information doesn't necessarily work very well for another manipulation task. Yeah, also another interesting research question. I think this is, is building on that question is, is can you, and you, you 
talked about human scanning the environment. Can you talk about um, vision-based tactile sensing and non-vision sensing approaches that, and, and what you see in the differences of those, if there are, there are opportunities in, in one approach or, over the other, um, trade-offs, those kinds of things? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, in fact, I've, I've been working with many different kinds of sensing modalities and vision or just like RGB, like just color images and video are, are very important, but I also worked a lot with just depth images. Um, so where you can directly perceive 3D structure of the world. And this is in fact very important for robot decision-making because they are moving in this 3D world. So they really have to understand how far away something is, uh, where uh, a robot hand is relative to this object, what the shape really of this object is, the three-dimensional shape. Um, so that's certainly really important. But then what is specifically important for manipulation is also the sense of touch. And um, that um, is a, like, especially once an object is in the hand or close to the hand, it's very important to use that kind of sense because there are a lot of occlusions just by the hand with, uh, of the object. And so it's important to use that other sense that is not affected by this occlusion. But um, it's very different from visual data. And also the hardware um, for uh, tactile sensing is actually not as advanced maybe as cameras or there are many different solutions, unclear what is the best one. Uh, and they are not like good, necessarily good uh, architectures to process this data. So this is also very open space, but it's undoubtedly, it's very important to, for a robot to have that sense of touch, but it's also like another open area that is very exciting to look at. And another interesting modality uh, that I haven't also not really shown is the modality of sound. So how um, if a robot, for example, taps on an object and it makes a sound or maybe with a tool or something like that, um, can it infer the material properties? Uh, it can, it turns out. And, um, and if, it, if it knows that, it can actually maybe adjust its manipulation strategy because, oh, it, it figured out it's glass, so it's more slippery. Or maybe it's uh, something rougher, uh, so it's, it's not as slippery, so it can like, somehow grasp it differently. So, so this is another uh, interesting uh, modality that is actually quite underexplored in, in robotics as well. That's that's uh, that's really interesting. It'd be exciting. <laughs> I I think uh, yeah. I, I be interesting to see how sound is is it figures into future robots in terms of figuring out their their environment. Um, I I wanted to come back to maybe some of the some questions around. I think it, it was your Unigrasp model and and mm -hmm. around the um and I, the the point clouds. So two two questions around that. One very specific is if it, that just came in is do you. Do you see any applications for, um, if, if I understand the point clouds were used to just configure the grippers themselves, did you, do you see any applications for configuring the whole arm using those models to configure the whole arm or other parts of the robot? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, um, I think, I think I see that, although I would say in that second part, uh, the robot arm actually had to be moved in such a way that none of its parts are colliding with the environment, um, while the hand is actually colliding with things, right? So it's a little bit of a different uh, problem, or the, the hand and the rest of the arm actually have slightly different goals. One is wants to get in, uh, in touch with things, the other one really doesn't want to get in touch with things. So um, it's slightly different, so I personally would solve the problem of what the arm is doing differently from what the hand is doing. Um, just because we, we can model it pretty well how to avoid collisions with an arm, while what the fine sensory motor control of fingers is, is like a different sort of problem that we don't have as good models for, as good cost functions to optimize and so on. Yeah, but I think you, you could do it, but I would, I would actually make a different choice. It's interesting, and maybe a follow-up on that is someone had asked why you need such high resolution on those point clouds if there are so few um, states of the uh, the small number of states for the actual gripper. Mm, I see. Um, I see. So I think that maybe refers to how the gripper is represented, although maybe it's just a two-fingered gripper and it has really just one degree of freedom can open and close the fingers. Um, 
Yeah, that's that's true. But there are, especially for the object, an object may have a very complex shape. Um, and even with just a simple gripper that can just open and close the fingers, there are still infinitely many ways to grasp that complex object. And so you want to really capture especially the shape of the of the object to match the the shape of the hand uh, to it. And so that's why I would say, um, you know, you need this point cloud and maybe, you know, you can down sample it. But uh, I think the, sh the shape, the complementary shape of the gripper to in these different configurations to the object is actually quite important to capture. Yeah, that's great. Um... I, we're, we're just about at time here. Uh, so maybe we've got a lot of really wonderful questions. We didn't get to them all, uh, but thank you all for participating. Jeanette, is there anything you would want to add or anything that you're particularly excited about in terms of next steps or, or the course that you'd want to leave everyone with? Uh, oh, I'm excited about so many different things that I already mentioned, like oh, uh, equipping robots with the ability to understand language, you know, that uh, that pe people talking to them and telling them what to do and them being able to do these things or using sound, for example. Um, so all of these th different things I'm excited about. And uh, I'm excited about exploring ideas that weren't even in my head. So in this course, it's like a great opportunity to explore these. So, um, and thank you very much, everyone, for um, uh, all these great questions that I saw and we couldn't even get to um, answering. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Jeanette. Thank you, everyone who joined us. And uh, we really appreciate your time, and we hope you enjoyed the session.